Hey, Scott Machine Gun Dad. Um, welcome back to the channel. Um, as you can see, I'm still in the old 8mm format. If you watched my last video, you would understand why. I'm still having fun with this. Um, basically, when I was like, getting my old 8mm camera working, I found a bunch of old 8mm tapes. Obviously, they dubbed my kids on the digital, but one of the tapes I found was another gun reference tape. This is a tape made by Alabama Arms back in the 90s, 96 I think, on uh, how to operate, maintain a 1919. Now you gotta realize in 1996 you could buy a transferable 1919 for a couple grand. So the average person actually could afford a machine gun back then. Um, I don't own the rights to this, so I won't monetize it. I'm just putting it up for people who may have an interest in the 1919 or just to see how we did it old school or they did it old school would want to see it so coming up is the Alabama ordinance uh, video uh, thanks again The Browning machine gun was designed by John Browning prior to the entry of the United States in the First World War. The machine guns of that era were still a novelty to the American armed forces, and no great effort was made to equip our armies with them. Near the end of the war, a small number of water-cooled Brownings, designated as the model of 1917, entered the war. They performed well. The Browning machine guns made during the First World War were later rebuilt to the model 1917A1 configuration and the model 1919's A4 and A6 were added before and during the Second World War. 30 caliber Browning machine guns were the standard machine guns of our fighting forces throughout the Second World War and into the Korean War. Until replaced by more modern weapons in the middle of the Vietnam War, the Browning in one of its three primary forms was the belt-fed machine gun of our armed forces. In the present day, the 30 caliber Brownings are mostly of interest to collectors and firearms historians. They are frequently encountered in reenactments and recreational machine gun shoots. The draw for this firearm is many fold. It is not so rare as to be unavailable. Spare parts are readily available. It is generally regarded as the most reliable machine gun ever made. It has great historical significance in having served as the primary machine gun for our armed forces for most of this century. For these, and many other reasons, the 30 caliber Browning machine gun is a very popular firearm. What I have before me here is probably the most common of the air-cooled Browning light machine guns, the model 1919A4. What I'd like to do first is walk you through the disassembly technique. The very first thing that you should do when you approach your Browning machine gun is make sure that it is unloaded. You do that by removing the top cover, pulling the bolt to the rear, and looking down inside the chamber to make sure that no cartridges are present. If it is unloaded, you may continue. In order to remove the bolt assembly, which is the first thing that you're going to want to work with, you have to compress the driving rod into the bolt. And the way that you do that is by taking a screwdriver or a cartridge rim, believe me, the screwdriver works much better, press in on the driving rod, and rotate it 90 degrees. You will feel it engage within the bolt. At that point, you can then move the bolt forward, and then you can remove the back plate. The way you remove the back plate 
is by prying forward on the cover latch and you can pull the back plate out of the gun. Normally you will not need to disassemble the back plate. It's full of some fiber discs. It has a clip on the bottom. Normally these things don't get dirty. You really wouldn't need to dismantle the back plate assembly unless you found that the plunger on the back plate was loose, in which case you'd have to do some repair. If it doesn't appear loose, don't worry about it. The next item that you'll want to remove from the gun is the bolt assembly. The bolt assembly is still retained by the cocking handle. You want to move the bolt assembly to the rear to the point at which you can take the cocking handle and pull it out of the large hole in the cocking handle slot. After that, you can then remove the bolt directly to the rear. We will talk about the further disassembly of the bolt later. The next thing that you'll want to remove from the gun is the entire barrel and lock frame assembly. In order to do that, you'll need some type of a punch. You can use the M6 combination tool, which has punches of the appropriate size on them. You can use a cartridge tip. This particular gun was designed to be able to be dismantled with a cartridge. Whatever you use, you'll have to press in into the latch pin and withdraw the barrel, lock frame, and barrel extension from the rear. The entire assembly should remain intact. In order to begin further disassembly, the first thing you would probably want to do is go ahead and remove the lock frame from the barrel extension. To do that, you simply take your thumb, grabbing the lock frame assembly, press up on the accelerator, and it will come loose in your hand. To remove the barrel extension from the barrel itself, it simply unscrews. We'll now begin to dismantle the bolt assembly. This is the bolt for the Browning machine gun. What we see on the bolt is we have the extractor, we have the cocking lever, we have the driving rod, the actual recoil spring for the gun is within the bolt. We have the actual sear assembly here, and the striker is found within the bolt. You can't see it from here. The very first thing that we're going to do, and probably the most hazardous for those people who are not used to attempting this procedure, is the removal of the driving spring. Now, the manuals will tell you one way to do it, but I'm going to show you a way that is a lot safer. It involves the use of a vise. What you'd want to do is place the end of the driving rod into the jaws of a vise. Make sure that the bolt is not fully seated, but protrudes a little bit. Tighten it up, and then you can press down on the bolt body, rotate it 90 degrees, and very carefully withdraw the bolt. And that completely removes the likelihood of the driving rod spring flying loose and striking you. Assembly is the opposite procedure and once again is greatly simplified with the use of a vise. It's a 90 degree movement. Very safe. The next thing that we'll do is completely dismantle the bolt assembly. The first thing that we'll take apart on the bolt is to remove the extractor assembly. It is removed by rotating 90 degrees and lifting directly off the bolt. The next thing that we'll remove is we'll remove the cocking lever. The cocking lever is right here, and it's one of the critical parts in that the order in which it is replaced in the bolt is absolutely critical. It can be replaced backwards, and if it is done so and you completely assemble the gun, you can possibly damage the gun. The only tool that you need for complete bolt disassembly is some type of a pin punch, as you see here. To remove the cocking lever, merely drift the pin out from one side to the other. The cocking lever will then come directly out of the bolt assembly. Notice on the cocking lever that there is a cutout to the rear. Ensure that you do not attempt to put the cocking lever into the bolt backwards and replace it. It must go in with the cutout facing to the rear of the bolt, the rear of the gun. The next thing that we we'll want to remove is the sear assembly. The sear assembly is right here. It's the thing that actually holds the striker to the rear when the gun is cocked. The sear assembly is in fact retained by the sear spring, which is a component which consists of a flat spring and a pin. In order to remove the sear, you have to take the flat spring, press it down, 
and move it slightly to my right. And when you do that, the sear will then drop directly out of the gun. You may, in fact, at this time, discharge the striker. There's the sear. The next thing to remove is the sear spring. Moving the sear spring out of its little engagement, taking a pin punch, pressing from the bottom of the bolt, it'll drop directly out. The next item to remove is the striker itself. The striker will normally slide directly out of the bottom of the bolt. This completes the thorough disassembly of the bolt. After you have disassembled the bolt, you'll probably want to clean all of the holes and ports in the bolt to make sure that there are no foreign bodies, no accumulations of cosmoline or heavy grease, which may impede further function. The assembly of the bolt is the reversal of the disassembly. The first th thing that you'll want to do is to replace the striker. The striker will only go in one way. You can see that the firing pin is in fact on one side of the striker. This is the sear engagement surface. It will be toward the bottom of the bolt. Drop it into place. The next thing that you'll put back in is the sear spring. It will go in through the top, press straight down. It'll lock into place. Then take the striker spring, the sear spring, move it down into its recess, and at this point you can replace the sear. Flip the bolt over, holding the sear in with your finger so it doesn't slide out, and then move the sear spring over back into engagement with the sear. Take the cocking lever, insert it through the top of the bolt, making sure that the cutout is toward the rear. Line up the hole through the bolt with the hole in the cocking lever and insert the pin. It'll slide directly into place. Take the extractor 90 degrees to the bolt body, place it straight down, rotate it down into position. This completes the assembly of the bolt. The next part that we will disassemble is known as the lock frame. You might think of the lock frame as a trigger housing. The purpose of the lock frame is to do two things. The first of which is to contain the trigger. This is the trigger that actually fires the gun. It does so by merely causing this particular tip here to interact with the sear, causing the sear to release the striker. The other function of the lock frame is to house the accelerator. This is the accelerator. The purpose of the accelerator is to accelerate the bolt rearward during the recoil cycle, and that's what makes the gun work in short recoil. In order to dismantle the lock frame, there are really only a couple of components that need to be removed. The accelerator can be removed by taking the pin, pushing it from one side, and extracting it as such. There's not really much to do with it. If you do find that the surface of the accelerator is nipped, chicked, cracked, or otherwise deformed, you would want to replace the accelerator. It should be a smooth, convex surface. The next part to remove is the trigger. You will have to remove the trigger if you have to do a timing adjustment on the gun. To remove the trigger, you simply take a pin, push it into the latch pin, which is on the opposite side, remove it and its captured spring, and the trigger will then come completely out. This particular spring, which moves the barrel extension and barrel forward and backward during recoil, is usually fairly difficult to remove, and normally it's not necessary. If you do have a particular malfunction, it may need to be replaced, but in routine cleaning, it's probably not prudent to remove it. To reassemble, simply place it back in, place the pin through the trigger, Place the accelerator on the lock frame. Press the pin back into place. That completes the assembly and disassembly of the lock frame. The next part is the barrel extension. The barrel extension is the part that is attached to the barrel itself and its function is to do two things. It aids in locking in that it does have the breech lock. This is the actual lock that locks the breech bolt to the barrel assembly and ensures that the gun does fire in a locked condition. The other thing it does is it transmits the recoil of the gun barrel rearward into the lock frame and through the accelerator 
to cause the bolt to travel faster to the rear, which is how the short recoil principle works. There are only two parts to a barrel extension that can be removed. Those are the small tension spring on the front. The tension spring engages in notches in the barrel end. These serve to cause the head space of the barrel to be retained during firing so that the barrel doesn't rotate during firing. Any barrel rotation during firing will cause the head space to change during firing. The other part that can be removed is the lock itself. It's done by driving the pin out and removing from the rear. Notice on the lock, there are beveled surfaces. The beveled surfaces have to face toward the front of the gun. The hole in the lock faces toward the bottom of the gun. It is possible to put this part in backwards as well. Try not to do that. Installation is the reversal. Normally, you do not need to move, remove the spring on the front of the barrel extension. It is normally crimped into place, and unless you are noticing that your barrel freely rotates on firing, there is no need to service it. That completes the barrel extension servicing. In order to begin reassembly, it is important to understand the relationship that exists between the barrel and the barrel extension. The barrel screws directly into the barrel extension. It normally screws very freely. Very little resistance is normally found. Until you get to the point where the notches in near the breech of the barrel begin to engage the spring which is found on the barrel extension. You may find that you will push the spring to the rear into the barrel extension. If that does occur, then you must pry up on this spring in order to free it so that it does not get between the barrel breech and the barrel extension. The purpose of the spring finger is to engage the notches in the barrel extension to hold the barrel in a particular rotational orientation. This keeps the barrel from rotating during firing, since headspace is set on the browning by the depth to which the barrel is threaded into the barrel extension. It is very important that the barrel not rotate when the gun is fired. Once you have threaded the barrel onto the barrel extension. Try to thread it on so far as to keep the breech face of the barrel level or even with the inside surface of the barrel extension. That will be a starting point toward your eventual head space correction. The next thing that you'll want to do is assemble the lock frame onto the barrel extension. This is a little tricky. What you'll want to do is to take the stud, which is at the rear of the barrel extension, and cause it to engage a recess which is found on the plunger rod in the lock frame. At the same time, you have to fold the accelerator underneath the extension of the barrel extension. It works like this. Once you've folded them up, you will then compress the lock frame onto the barrel extension. And you will hear them snap together. When they snap together, you can release it. It will retain its position and orientation. If they do not stay connected, then you've made a mistake in your alignment somewhere. You'll have to put it back together again, take it apart, reassemble. It's not difficult once you've done it a few times. After you've completed this partial assembly, you're ready to place the sub-assembly back into the gun. Take the barrel assembly with the barrel extension lock frame and slide them in from the rear into the gun. You'll have to depress the lock frame latch in order to clear the side plate of the gun and complete the assembly. Sometimes the barrel will catch on the inside of the muzzle bearing. You just need to lift up on the barrel slightly near the muzzle through one of the holes in the barrel jacket 
and you can get the entire assembly in. After the barrel and barrel extension and lock frame have been inserted into the receiver, the next thing to do is to place the bolt back into the gun. You have to make sure that the cocking lever is in the forward position on the bolt. Failure to do so will prevent you from getting the bolt into the gun. When you do place the bolt into the gun, you have to be careful not to let the bolt drop as you place it into the gun. If you do so, you will strike the accelerator and cause the accelerator to push the barrel and barrel extension up into battery. If you do that, you won't be able to get the bolt into the gun until you cause the barrel extension to come back to the rear again, and you'll do that by pressing in on the muzzle. So very carefully work the bolt into the receiver until you get it to the point where you can take the cocking handle and push it through the side of the receiver into the engagement of the bolt. At that point, you can ride the bolt forward all the way into battery. If the bolt does not, if the bolt does not go completely into battery, then your head space is too tight and you'll have to back off on the barrel threading before it will go completely into battery. If it does go into battery, you're done assembling the bolt and you can then continue to assemble the gun. The next part to replace is the backplate assembly. It will drop directly into the rear of the receiver. You'll probably have to pry the cover latch forward. It'll drop into place. The next thing that you'll have to do is pull the bolt to the rear. Holding the bolt handle to the rear carefully, using a screwdriver, insert it into the driving rod, rotate it counterclockwise 90 degrees, and let the bolt go forward. Make sure that the loading lever in the top cover is all the way to the left so that the stud will engage into the cam surface in the top of the bolt. You can close the top cover. That completes the assembly of the machine gun. The head space is measured as the distance between the bolt face and the breech end of the barrel itself and it can be measured by taking a 1 8 inch drill bit and attempting to insert it between the bolt face and the end of the barrel. If it will freely fit, then your head space is perfectly adjusted. If it doesn't fit, or if it fits too loosely, then you must change the head space adjustment, and you do that by rotating the barrel to the right or to the left to thread it in or out of engagement with the barrel extension. This will change its location relative to the gun forward or backward. In order to perform the adjustment on the barrel, you don't have to take the gun completely apart. You do have to pull the bolt slightly to the rear and lock it to the rear so that you will have access to the engagement. I'll show you. Pulling the bolt to the rear, you can take the extractor and move it slightly to the side and it will engage the side of the side plate and hold the bolt to the rear. There are notches in the barrel and these notches engage that finger that I showed you earlier in the barrel extension and those cause the barrel to stay in a particular orientation. The bolt felt like it was a little tight so in order to loosen it we will rotate the barrel notches one click at a time and recheck. It still feels a little tight. Never make head space adjustments more than one notch at a time. That feels perfect. That completes the head space adjustment for the Browning machine gun. It can all be done from the breech end. Setting the timing on a Browning machine gun is something that is normally difficult to do. Measuring the timing is not. It is very important that the timing on the Browning machine guns be set according to proper specifications or severe damage to the gun or fire could result. To check the timing on a Browning machine gun, it is best to use a timing gauge set. They normally come in a go and no-go gauge set. Dimensions are all that are critical and ordinary feeler gauges will suffice. First thing that you can do is to check the no-go gauge. By pulling the bolt slightly to the rear, you insert the no-go gauge between the barrel extension and the trunnion. Let it rest, and then attempt to pull the trigger. The gun should not fire. 
If the gun does fire, your timing is out of adjustment. Then withdraw the no-go gauge, place the go gauge between the barrel extension and the trunnion, pull the trigger again. It should fire. If the gun does pass the go and no-go test, the timing is adjusted properly. No further adjustment is necessary. In order to alter the timing of the Browning machine gun, you actually have to bend the trigger itself. In order to bend the tip of the trigger, it is best to remove it from the assembly. And then use a vise to actually affect the bending of the trigger. The part that you're going to bend is just the front tip. You want the bend to occur right about there. And the best way to do that is to go ahead and insert it into a vise and then apply rearward pressure or forward pressure in order to affect that bend. Most of these triggers are not hardened. It will not take much pressure to bend and the only amount of movement that you're going to make is going to be a few thousandths of an inch. 10 to 20 thousandths at most will normally be required in order to bring a machine gun into spec. And remember what you're trying to do. If you wish to cause the gun to fire sooner, then you want to bend the trigger tip downward. If you want the gun to fire later, you want to bring the trigger tip upward. Those are the directions that will make the changes that we've discussed. On the gun itself, you might wish to dismantle the muzzle bearing for proper cleaning. Normally, the muzzle bearing on the tip of the barrel shroud can simply be removed by hand. If, in fact, it is difficult to remove, you have several options. The original military dismantling tool looks like this. It has a, a groove in the muzzle bearing which corresponds to a key which is in the tool, and it will engage it. You can pass a one half inch diameter rod through the tool, and it will turn off the muzzle bearing. Normally, you only need to loosen it, and then you can remove it by hand. There is a very important reason why you need to remove and clean the muzzle bearing. There is a close tolerance fit in the inside of the muzzle bearing to the muzzle of the gun itself. This close tolerance fit is necessary for the proper operation of the gun. The Browning light machine guns in air-cooled configuration utilize some of the gas pressure from the propelling cartridges to force the barrel assembly rearward and aid in recoil. If, in fact, the muzzle binds with the muzzle bearing, you'll get sluggish operation. If the clearance is too great, you'll also get sluggish operation. The muzzle bearing fouls with carbon fouling from the actual combustion of the cartridges and with copper fouling from the jackets of the bullets. There is an easy way to clean out the muzzle bearing. If you do much firing with this gun, you will get some deposits inside the muzzle bearing that will affect its performance and possibly its reliability of operation. Now, at one time, there was a fairly complicated muzzle bearing scraping tool that was developed solely for the cleaning of the muzzle bearings. That tool is not really necessary. All that is necessary is to clamp it in a vise or some holding, take a section of cleaning rod and attach it to a one and a quarter inch diameter steel brush and use an electric drill. And you'll find that you'll be able to clean one of these things out very easily and do an excellent job. If you do this after you fire, you have no need for worrying about scraping excessive deposits or using any type of reaming devices which could damage the steel of the bearing itself. This is the model 1917A1 water-cooled Browning 30 caliber machine gun. It differs from the model 1919A4 and A6 in having a water jacket that surrounds a lighter weight barrel in order to keep it cool. There's been a lot of consideration given to the design of this gun in being able to permit long periods of extended fire. With the air-cooled guns, you can only fire a few hundred rounds at a time before you must either change the barrel due to overheating or you have to simply stop firing because the barrel will overheat. As long as water in liquid form is kept within the jacket of the Model 1917A1, it can be continued to fire. In fact, in the earliest years in testing, they were able to fire one of these guns for 45 minutes continuously without stopping to reload. So it won't overheat. The water jacket is filled by removing the plug at the top, 
and using a funnel, tipping the barrel down slightly, you can put about one gallon of water into the barrel. It's probably a good idea to use a 50-50 mix of water and antifreeze to keep from rusting the inside of the water jacket because the water jacket is steel. But you don't want to put straight antifreeze or oil or something else into the water jacket if you intend to fire extended bursts from the gun. The reason is because this gun works well because of the evaporative cooling that takes place when the gun burst actually boils the water. It's a phase change heat transfer process. It's very efficient. Anything that you do to raise the temperature at which the fluid within the jacket boils will decrease the efficiency with which it may operate. So you do want to have some antifreeze to keep from rusting. You don't want to have too much to prevent the fluid from boiling. You want it to boil. When it does boil, it's not going to spew water out the side of the jacket. The gun is very ingeniously designed and in fact has a steam port which is down here on near the front of the muzzle. This steam port should not be plugged unless you're trying to keep the plug from swinging around in storage. When the gun is firing, steam will come out of the port. In operation and combat, they frequently would attach a hose to this steam port and run it into a water can as a condenser. It was then used as a means to conserve water and to hide the position of the gun. In cold weather, enemy could see where the gun was by spotting where the steam was coming out. Some of the steam hoses were 20 feet in length to put the source of the steam far from its where it was seen. When you do want to change the water in the gun, you can drain it through the drain plug on the opposite end of the barrel. You can keep both plugs tightly sealed when you're actually firing the gun because, as I said, the steam and pressure will automatically be vented through the bottom hole here. You'll also notice that you may occasionally get some dripping of water out of the end of the muzzle or the breech. That's okay. Small drips won't hurt a thing. There is a packing material that is placed inside the water cap and around the end of the barrel in order to help seal up these ends. As this barrel must move laterally within the gun when it fires, you have to have a reciprocating seal to permit this motion while still maintaining water tightness. In a few moments, I will go over how you change this packing and inspect it. Other differences between this gun are in the sight system. The sights on the Model 1917 have a much longer sight radius, and they are graduated to permit firing at a much greater range. The Model 1917A1 is graduated up to 2,600 yards on the sights. The Model 1919A4 is typically are graduated only to 1,500 yards. This is not to say that it is necessarily more accurate, but in common practice, due to the tightness of the muzzle gland and the tightness of the feeding at the breech, it usually is a much more precisely functioning gun. This particular gun is mounted in a Model 1917A1 tripod. The Model 1917A1 tripod will also just as easily mount the 1919A4 or A6 air-cooled guns. The guns will swap freely between tripods. However, most people prefer to use the heavy tripod for the heavy gun. This is how it would have been issued and used in combat in the early years of both World War II and the Korean conflict. They did have a few of these in use in World War I, but they were very rare. In order to begin to work on this gun, we would dismantle it pretty much the same way we would the air-cooled gun. We'll go into that now. First thing that you would do, folding over the sight, retracting the latch, raising the top cover. You will then want to pull the bolt to the rear, check to make sure that your chamber is clear and empty, and then using a screwdriver or the end of the M6 combination tool which has a screwdriver blade, you want to go ahead and rotate 90 degrees, the driving rod, pull the bolt slightly forward, pull the cover latch forward, remove the back plate, move the bolt to the rear, remove the handle, remove the bolt. No different at all from the Model 1919A4. Then you're going to get ready to move the barrel and barrel extension in the lock frame. If there is water in the jacket and you don't want to lose it, all you have to do is rotate the gun to the downward position in the tripod and go ahead and depress the lock frame latch and start to draw the lock frame out. Don't pull it all the way out, just get it a little loose. 
A lot of people wonder what that cork is for on the end of the chain. It's to follow the barrel into the gun so that when you pull out the barrel group from the rear, that you can keep the water from coming out the end of the muzzle. Notice that the barrel is much lighter in weight, much narrower and thinner than your standard barrel. This particular barrel is a custom-made barrel. It's chambered in 8mm Mauser, a common conversion caliber, and has two sets of packing grooves at the end of the breech. This is to double the water seal efficiency. Most of them only have one in the back. Notice that there's no groove at the front. That's not necessary. The packing in the front is retained in the brass housing and encircles the barrel. The barrel then moves within the packing as such. In order to reassemble the gun, take the barrel group, work it in, You'll catch the plug as it comes out the other end. Let it hang free. Once you have the barrel assembly in, you can then re-elevate the gun. You don't have to worry about leakage from that point. As before, you take the bolt. Make sure that the cocking lever is in the forward position. Very carefully put it into the gun, holding it at both ends. As soon as the bolt handle can be placed into the bolt, move it forward, take the back plate, place it on, drop it into place, pull the bolt all the way to the rear, engage a screwdriver in the driving rod slot, that completes the assembly of the gun. On most of the Model 1917A1 guns, the trunnion itself is made of brass. That means that the feed plate itself is made of brass. If you do intend to fire one of these guns, it would probably be best to stick to cloth belted ammunition. If you do choose to use the steel linked, metal linked ammunition, you will probably severely abrade your trunnion surface. If you do abrade it sufficiently, you will either have to repair it by welding or you will wind up getting feed failures and other malfunctions. The gun was designed long before the metal links were designed. That's the reason for the defect. In general, you can use the cloth belts on any of the guns. The steel linked belts should be restricted to those guns that have steel trunnions. The Model 1917A1 utilized a special packing material around both the muzzle and the breech end in order to keep the water from leaking out of the barrel jacket. The original packing material was a 1 8 inch diameter asbestos yarn. Since asbestos yarn is very difficult to obtain these days and somewhat hazardous to work with, I found that Teflon yarn works very well. It has a very high melting temperature and it will seal perfectly and lubricate at the same time. In order to pack the breech end, all you really have to do is take a bit of the twine and work it into the groove and wind it on. You want to wind it on as tightly as you can. You want to pack it in very tightly. And you'll have to do a little bit of trial and error depending upon the particular twine that you have to make sure that you don't pack it on too thick. When you get to the point where you can feel that it is seemingly just above the surface of the barrel, you want to cut off your excess and then taking a knife blade or a screwdriver, work the end of the packing back into the barrel groove. You don't want to have any of the packing hanging out. If you do, it'll come loose when the gun is fired and it'll unravel. Once you've worked it in, you can take some grease, work it into the grooves, pack it in nicely, and then you can work it backwards into the trunnion to seat the packing before you switch the barrel back around and actually insert it into the gun. Now we'll talk about the muzzle packing. In order to change the muzzle packing on the Model 1917, you have to take the muzzle gland out. The easiest tool to use, other than a regular crescent wrench, is the M6 combination tool. 
The M6 combination tool has a cutout fitting on it, which is a perfect match for the barrel nut on not only the 1917A1, but the 1919A6 as well. They're standard right hand threads. Go ahead and turn it on out. Once you've loosened it, you can usually remove it by hand unless it's corroded. What you see here is an original asbestos rope seal as taken out of an original gun. You can get an idea about how much packing is involved by taking a look at what was originally used. In order to pack the muzzle, you simply take the Teflon yarn that you're using and wrap it around the muzzle. You want to try to achieve a thickness of approximately 1 8 inch at a distance of approximately 3 quarters of an inch. Just wrap it around. Once you get it wrapped around, you press it toward the breech. You take your gland nut, you put it onto the barrel, and you thread it into place. Once you feel resistance, try to work the barrel back with the cocking handle and see whether or not the resistance seems excessive. If it does not seem excessive, you're ready to check for a water leak. If after you fill the barrel jacket, you do get a water leak, you'll need to take your combination tool and go ahead and tighten the gland nut further until such time as the leakage stops. If the leakage does not stop and you then begin to notice that you do have excessive tension on the barrel, then you must repack the gland. You've got your cord crossed, or you haven't put enough cord on, or you've done something else wrong. The Model 1917A1 has a tripod which is specifically designed to facilitate the mounting of an ammunition can. The original boxes that were used with this machine gun were made of wood and they were made to slide directly into the tripod, open up so you can extract the belt and load the gun. In World War II, they came out with some metal cans that also permitted this feature. They're somewhat different from the modern military ammunition can, but they work pretty much the same way. They do have a little lip that you can attach so that it will hang onto the side of the tripod. These cans, though, are a little more fragile and are somewhat difficult to obtain, so some enterprising individuals have come up with an adapter. This adapter, which I would highly recommend anyone to obtain, permits you to mount a standard 30 caliber ammunition can to the tripod. It's quite sturdy and quite useful. This is the Model 1918 cloth belt loading machine. It is the device that is used to insert the individual cartridges within the cloth belts that are then used to feed into the Browning machine gun. You can use metal linked ammunition, but that uses a different device to load that, which we will cover later. Right now, what we're gonna do is discuss the 1918 belt loading machine, how it's used, how it works. There is a feed strip on the top of the machine. The feed strip is grooved. Into the grooves, the cartridges will slide. They have to be placed in such a way that they will slide down, but will not pull forward. When you put the belt feed, or the cartridge feed on top of the machine, you can then drop the cartridges down into the slot into the machine. Make sure that you do put a lot of cartridges on the slide. You don't want to just load three or four at a time because the rhythm that you set up when you begin to actually load the belt is very important for smooth operation. If you jerk the belt loading machine around, you'll probably jam it. If you do jam the belt loading machine, stop back up, reload the machine. It is very easy to damage the needles. It is very easy to puncture a belt. You have to be very smooth and careful in the operation of the machine, but if it is adjusted properly and your rhythm is properly maintained, you can very, very rapidly load a belt with this machine. 
After you've taken the cartridges and placed them into the feed strip, go ahead and turn the crank handle until you get a cartridge starting to move forward. Once you have one starting to move forward, stop. Go ahead and take a single cartridge, place it into the belt loop. Don't forget that the belt loops are marked with a color coding, which indicates the direction from which the cartridges must be inserted. They must be inserted in the direction from the colored end closest to the edge of the belt. Put one cartridge in, doesn't have to be at the very end of the belt, it can be anywhere out there. Place it directly onto the loading machine, work the belt in, close the needle levers, close the side latch, close the top, but don't latch it just yet. Begin to work the belt a little bit next cartridge is in fact going into the belt loop. If it is, then go ahead and lock it on down. And continue. You want to set up a rhythm that is very smooth. You want to make sure that any time you stop moving that the handle is in the downward position. This is the normal cadence that you would expect to use. Anytime you stop, make sure the handle is in the down position. Make sure that you do not completely run out of cartridges in your feed tray. Make sure there are always a few left. And go ahead and load some more in. And when you finish filling up the feed tray, make sure that the belt does not bind. Continue to load. Another thing that you need to make sure of is that your cartridges, when they're finished, do not hang more than two feet below the belt loading device. If they do hang with more than two feet of actual belt weight, it may cause the machine to jam. You need to be very careful that the belt is not twisted as it comes into the machine. Use your left hand to hold the machine, guide the belt. Use your right hand to turn the crank. Don't forget, always stop with the crank in the downward position. On the 1918 belt loading machine, there's only one adjustment that you need to make. That is this distance between the needle tips on the upper and lower needle arms. When the needle arms are closed, there should be about 10 thousandths inch clearance between the tips of the needles. You should be able to slide a feeler gauge of 10 thousandths inch thickness between them. If you can't do that, then you need to adjust the needles by loosening the screws both on the top and the bottom set. That will require disassembling the machine somewhat, but the needles do have to be somewhat apart, about 10 thousandths inch, and equally spaced. That's the only real adjustment that you have to make on the machine. This is the M3 link loading machine. It is designed to take the cartridges and place them within disintegrating steel links to per basically manufacture a long belt of nearly infinite length. Hopefully you'll keep yours to 250 rounds or less. The way you load the link loading machine is to place the links individually in the slots right behind the rib. Whether you start from the right or the left or place the links upside down or right side up doesn't matter so long as the small diameter of the link is placed toward the front of the loading device. That'll be the one that's closest to the bullet tip when it's actually loaded. Place them in individually until you line the complete length of it if you wish. Take the cartridges individually and partially insert them into the links laying them in the tray in the grooves. Do not put a cartridge in either the first or the last end of the link because you'll need those open for joining them with other links. By merely closing the handle, it will push the cartridges up into the link and you'll have a belt. This is the model 1919 A4 30-caliber air-cooled Browning light machine gun. What we're going to do first, before we actually fire the weapon, showing you the loading procedure, is do a preliminary check of the headspace and timing. This is not something that you have to do every time before you fire, but if you have not fired recently, it is always a good idea to check these particular features. In order to measure the headspace of the Browning machine gun, you use a headspace gauge such as you see here. Opening the top cover, 
moving the extractor back, you want to see if the go gauge will in fact drop into the slot between the barrel and the bolt face. If it will easily go, invert the gauge and make sure that the no-go gauge does not go in. You can force a no-go gauge in. Be careful that you are not applying pressure and tricking the gun. It should easily drop in with the go. It should not drop in with the no-go gauge. The go dimension is 123 thousandths of an inch. The no-go gauge is 128 thousandths of an inch. Generally, a 1 8 inch drill bit works very well for this. The next thing that we're going to measure is the timing. This is an original military timing gauge. It has both a go and a no-go dimension. In order to check out the timing of the gun, make sure that the gun is cocked. Take the timing gauge first with the go gauge. Place it between the trunnion and the barrel extension. You'll have to withdraw the barrel extension slightly. Insert it, let it rest, and pull the trigger. The striker should fall. Then recock the gun using the thicker portion. Place it once again in the same position and pull the trigger. The striker should not fall. If it passes these two tests, the weapon should be ready to load and fire. After you have determined that the headspace and timing are properly set for your gun, you may then begin to load and fire it. Remember that if you ever fire a Browning machine gun, it is only safe to fire from a fixed tripod position firmly on the ground. It is not safe to fire one of these weapons if the tripod is on concrete or other slick surface. Make sure that your traverse and elevation mechanisms are securely attached because this gun can get away from you if you're not careful. We'll now go into the loading procedure. In order to load the weapon, first open the top cover, pull the extractor back, lay the belt in in such a way that the first cartridge is immediately to the right of the belt feed pawl. Lower the extractor, keep the belt in place, close the top cover. At this point, you would pull the charging handle back twice. That will fully load the weapon. An alternate method of loading the weapon is to place the cartridge all the way over so that the base of the cartridge is against the bolt face. Lower the extractor, close the top cover. In this case, you would only pull the charging handle back one time and the weapon will be fully loaded. At this point, the weapon is ready to fire. Remember, there is not a safety device on this weapon. If you pull the trigger, the gun will fire. When mounted on the M2 tripod, the Browning machine gun is designed to be fired from the prone position. When you do fire, make sure that you are firmly grasping the weapon with both hands and that you are firmly supporting it. There will be recoil. Make sure that you have your sights properly set. The front sight folds up and down. Make sure it's folded up. At close range, up to 100 meters, you may use the rear sight in the folded down or battle sight position. There's a V-notch like on a conventional rifle sight, and that is used for firing it up to 100 meters. When you have completed firing, it is very important to clear the weapon properly. In order to do so, first, raise the top cover and extract the remainder of the belt of ammunition. Remember, there is still a cartridge in the chamber and the weapon is still cocked. At this point, you will want to pull the bolt handle back and you will see the cartridge on the bolt face. It will drop free and then pull the extractor out and slide it over to the side and it will lock the bolt to the rear. This will ensure that anyone can see from any orientation, the top cover is up, the bolt is locked to the rear, the extractor is up, the weapon is safe. One of the most common malfunctions that you may encounter with a Browning 30 caliber machine gun is caused by excessive headspace. If you have an excessive headspace malfunction, you will first notice that your bolt handle is about halfway in the slot and the gun has stopped firing. First thing that you want to do is open up your top cover and inspect. And when you look down, you should see a live round attempting to enter the chamber. When you see the live round in the chamber, first pull the bolt back. If you're lucky, it will pull out the remainder of the casing that's in the chamber. If it doesn't, then you must remove the bolt from the bolt face. Work with the extractor until you clear the round. 
Then what you want to do is you want to use the stuck case extractor. This is the tool that should be used with the Browning 30 caliber machine gun. The way it works is you will insert this portion into the chamber. It will snatch the casing remnant, and when you pull it to the rear, it will pull it out. Withdraw it, and the remnant of the casing should come out with it. At this point, your stuck case has been extracted. This is the model 1917A1 30 caliber water-cooled Browning machine gun. It is presently mounted on the model 1918 tripod. We're going to go ahead and load and fire the weapon. We've already checked the headspace and timing and its alta specification. This one is currently chambered for the 8mm Mauser ammunition. The loading and the firing of this weapon is exactly the same procedure as used in the air-cooled gun.